I want to take a look at the concept of value at risk. Now, value at risk is a risk management approach that attempts to quantify potential losses. Now, usually when we look at risk, we use some measure of volatility like the standard deviation or the variance. The problem with these measures is they treat gains the same as losses, and gains are not the same as losses. Gains are a good thing. So value at risk allows us just to look at the losses, and it looks at the risk of losing money. There are three components of VAR, time period, confidence level, and loss amount. And VAR answers a question something like, what is the most I can, for example, with a 95% level of confidence, expect to lose in dollar terms over the next month? How are we going to calculate VAR? We're going, there are three methods. Um, the first method is the historical method. Here we're going to collect actual return data and create a histogram. And that's basically going to give us a distribution we can look at. So for example, this is information or data on the daily returns of the NASDAQ 100. And you can see that you know, there are returns all over the place, okay, going way out here to as much as 13% in a day to um, as low as about 8%, uh, minus 8% in a day. And the 5% cutoff is, be, is between 4 and 8 percent. So we would feel 95 percent confident that returns are not going to be below 4 percent. Is it possible for them to be below 4 percent? Well, sure it is. But we feel 95 percent confident that they're going to be 4 percent or less because that's all this area over here. Okay. It could turn out to be minus 8%, but that's not very likely. The second method is known as the variance-covariance method. And this assumes that stock returns are normally distributed. In this case, we only need the expected or average return and the standard deviation. And if we know those, then we can go to the statistical tables and we can look at the probabilities under the normal distribution curve. And for 95% confidence, the critical value for a one for one-tailed test, it's not really a test, but that critical value for one tail is minus 1.96, and we multiply it by the standard deviation, that's going to give us our VAR. Um, for 99%, it's minus 2.58, and again, we'll multiply it by the standard deviation. So let's take a look at um, an example. For this data, the standard deviation is 2.64 percent, and the average daily returns are close to zero, so we're going to use zero there. So for 95 percent confidence, we're going to take the minus 1.96, multiply it by the 2.64, and we're going to get a value of minus 5.17 percent. So that's our, we feel 95 percent confident that the loss is not going to exceed 5.17%. Likewise, we can do it for 99% and we get minus 6.81%. And you'll notice if you're going to have a, if you want to be more confident, okay, 99% confident as opposed to 95% confident, then the loss, okay, the value at risk is going to be greater. You're going to have to move more to the left on that curve. Okay, here, here's this data that we had before in the first graph we looked at, and rather than use the data, we're going to assume that the data is normally distributed. That's what this line is here. And we're going to, instead of picking the lowest 5% and seeing what the cutoff is, we're going to actually use the statistical information to find it, and that's why we get this uh, minus 5.17 percent. So it's pretty close to what we had before. Before we had 4 percent. This is 5.17. The third approach is known as the Monte Carlo simulation approach. Here we generate a model of future stock returns and we, we run numerous trials to get a distribution. So this allows us to incorporate 
information into the stock return generating process. And this might be useful if we think that things have changed, perhaps the structure of, of the economy, um, that historical information is not going to be useful. So here we're going to model it and we're going to generate a distribution. So here we generate this di distribution on a hundred random trials. So you set up the model and you don't do it once, you do it a number of times, in this case a hundred times, but you could do it a thousand times or ten thousand times depending on um, your computing power and how much time and effort you want to spend. And here in this case, the two worst outcomes are down here. So these, are, this would be, I'm sorry, these the five worst outcomes are down here in the red. And that would be our 5% cutoff. So that would be someplace in the, you know, 15%, 20% range. So you can see that we can do it this way. I believe this was done with monthly data. So that's why you have a bigger number here, you know, minus 20% as opposed to minus 5%. If you happen to have information from different periods, you can convert them. For example, you can convert daily, a daily standard deviation to a monthly standard deviation um, by using the formula that the standard deviation, um, the monthly standard deviation is approximately equal to the daily standard deviation times the square root of t. And in this case, we Note that there are approximately 20 trading days for mo per month, so the adjustment would be times the square root of 20. If you wanted to take daily and compute it to annual, you would multiply by the square root of 250 because there are about 250 trading days in a year. If you had monthly data and you wanted to convert it to annual, you, the T would be 12 because there are 12 months in a year. So. Let's go back to our previous example. So we had a standard deviation, a daily standard deviation of 2.64. And if we want to convert it to monthly, we'll multiply this to get the monthly standard deviation. We'll multiply by the square root of 20, and we get 11.81. So the variance, I'm sorry, the, the value at risk at the 95% level would be minus 1.96 times the 11.81, and so we get minus 23.14%. For the 99% confidence interval, we'll use the critical value of minus 2.58, and we get minus 30.47. So you'll notice that over a longer time period, the value at risk is much greater, and that makes sense, right? There are more days when the um, when the stock, or the in this case, the index, could go down. And we also, again, notice that if we want to have greater confidence, we have to accept a greater potential loss. So a few facts about VAR, just to summarize. The greater the confidence, the larger the potential loss. The longer the time period, the larger the potential loss. I noted it before, but we should make sure we feel comfortable with this it's possible to lose more than the calculated value. Okay? That only gives us a 95% confidence, but there's also that one in a million chance. And this happens all the time. People mistake the fact that something has a low probability for it having zero probability. And if you think about it, this is the reason we buy things like life insurance. Okay? A 40-year-old person is probably not going to die in the next year. But that probability isn't zero. It's very low, but it isn't zero. And that's why if that person has dependents, they probably should buy life insurance. Um, we also noted how you convert from one time period to the other by taking the standard deviation and multiplying it by the square root of the number of trading days. So. That's the general basics of VAR. It provides another method um, for measuring risk, and it's become a popular measure for um, financial institutions to, to look at.